So do me a favor, grab your Bibles, um, go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to read one verse of scripture, then we're going to pray, and then we're going to talk through um, what the Lord has on my heart for you this morning. So Matthew chapter 6, and jump down to verse 10. If you are there, let me know by the sign by saying amen. Do something I normally don't do, just going to jump right to the verse, out of context, um, just to share it, but not out of context, without giving you any literary context, so God can move. Here's what I want to read, verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done, and I say where, you say where? How? One more time, your kingdom come, your will be done, where? How? As it is in heaven. Uh, let me share this big idea with you, then we're going to pray and allow God to move and have his way. Here's what I want you all to take away um, today, is that God's children are, to call, are called to be persistent in prayer until the appearance of his kingdom. You and I are called to remain persistent in prayer until his kingdom comes. Turn to your real quick and say, neighbor, pray until God's kingdom comes. Let us pray, then we're going to go to the Word. Father, we thank you for you. We worship and adore you. We bless your name. You're an awesome, you're wonderful, you're gracious, you're mighty God, Lord. As we stand to say, thus saith the Lord, I empty myself up, self up and invite you to fill me afresh. Not this morning's anointing, but this afternoon's anointing, God. We want a fresh word from you, God. Speak to these people. These are your people as you would want them to be spoken to. I remove myself out of the way. I eliminate flesh and invite you, God, to take residence. So thank you for what you're doing. You're such an awesome, a gracious, a mighty God, Lord. So we give this evening to you, this afternoon to you, that your word would go forth and we would have more of a feel of what it is to reign with you. So bless and have your way, God. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Last week when we, thank you guys, last week when we, um, we interesting passage of scripture, and um, you know, sometimes as a pastor, as a preacher, I'm one of those weird guys that kind of keep track of just every message that I've spoken since I've been called to preach back in, I would say, 1980, dating my, no, 88, dating myself. And, um, and what's striking is the message I went to yesterday, I noticed last week, that I had never um, spoken on that text. You've read the parable, but you've never spoken on it or preached on it. So it's very, very interesting for me to really dig that up and, and to, to lock into the, the place of persistency in prayer, right? That this woman, because of her persistency, that this unjust judge was able to listen to her. And the, the message you take away from that is that you and I have to get to the place where we keep knock, 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 knocking on heaven's door over and over and over again because God wants that from us. Come on, say amen if you believe that. Amen. amen. But by way of what I want to talk about today, I want to paint a scenario of what life must have been like in Eden. If you were to go back with me to the Garden of Eden back in the book of Genesis chapter 1, when God created Adam and Eve, they had what I would refer to as a unique relationship with him. And what is meant by that phrase, they had a unique relationship with him, here's what it looks like. They had this near and this distant relationship at the same time. In other words, as it relates to Adam and Eve, God seems transcendent, he seemed far away, but at the same time he seemed eminent. And here's what that would look like. In the morning, the Bible says in the book of Genesis that God would come down and he would fellowship with them. He would hang out with them. He would talk to them. They would have fellowship. But then it would seem like at the end of the conversation that God would retreat. God would go away. And on the surface at least, it looked as if Adam and Eve were left to fend for themselves in the garden. Now, because of New Testament theology, we understand fully well that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere and at the same time. So through the lens of God, there is no such thing as far and near. Come on, talk to me. Y'all get what I'm saying? But from a humanistic perspective, from my lens and from your lens, um, here's what we say. I feel God and I don't feel God. Come on, yeah. Come on y'all. 
Sometimes we come to church, God ain't here. I'm like, well, where did he go? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you can't get where I'm going. He, 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 it, the psalm says it this way, do I not fill the earth, the heavens and the earth, said the Lord. But what's interesting, reading, reading the, the text in Genesis through human lens, right? That's, that's the term anthropomorphisms. Through the eyes of humans, it looked as if in the cool of the day, God would come down. Hey, what's up, Adam? Hey, what's up, Eve? They would share their, ch- their, their concerns, their cares, their joys, their whatever their situation is. Then God would retreat. He would go away, and they'd be left by themselves. Now, at the introduction of sin, in other words, when men and women um, fell into sin from the temptation of the tempter, notice what happened. Um, it was after their sin that God no longer had this near relationship with them. You guys remember that, right? So here's what the text says. He placed them outside the garden and he placed an fi- uh, angel with a, fir- a, f- a flaming sword to the east, uh, one to guard the other gate, so that they had no more access to the garden. And so what happens now is in the cool of the day when they would expect God to come down, God would not come down. Right. Um, and, and all of a sudden, what was a near far relationship seems to be a completely distant relationship where they no longer had access to God from their vantage point. Now, here's the grace and the beauty of God. God's goal is never to remain far away from us. Come on, say amen. Talk to me, y'all. His intent is not that we not feel his presence. His intent is never that we be left alone and not have access to him. So what does God do? Because of his graciousness and his sovereignty, he promises to send himself in the form of his son to bridge the chasm and rebuild the relationship that he once had with Adam and Eve. Now, this promise was not only made to Adam and Eve, it was extended to the entire world. So here's what New Test- Old Testament theology looked like. If you're Adam and, and you're Eve and you knew what it was like to be in the presence of God every day. Come on, talk to me. And you knew what it was like to hear the voice of God and you knew what it was like to commune with God and to have him at the dinner table and to share with him. And then all of a sudden that's God. If I'm you, and and if you're me, and if we're in that systems, there there is a void in our life. Come on, talk to me this morning. There's something broken and something missing. So when God promises that I'm going to send my son, and and, and, and if I have a, a commitment to praying consistently, here is what my prayer looks like. Hurry up, Jesus, come. Come on, talk to me. Would that be you? I mean, if you knew what it was like to be in his presence and all of a sudden he's taken away and you missed it. But God said, I'm going to send a a Messiah. I'm going to send my son to come and break the chasm. Every day when I'm praying, here's my prayer. Hurry up and come, Jesus. And then I'm asking the question, when are you going to come, God? Come on. And, 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 And more importantly, because I know what it felt like to be in the presence of God, that's my everyday prayer. I'm not stopping, I'm not ceasing until he shows up because I know what it was like to be in his presence. Are you hearing me this morning? Now, now the reason I want to lay that foundation, we're going to go to the New Testament passage that we just read and we're going to return to it because I want you to hear me say that that probably was the prayer of the Old Testament saints. Hey, Adam, what was it like to be in the presence of God? Hey, Eve, what was it like to have God fellowship with you and then to know that that relationship has been broken and it's been severed and there's a need to bring it back together? The prayer as a community would be, God, hurry up, come on, send the Messiah because we need to have you with us. And Jesus now, he comes on the scene in the New Testament And in the New Testament, I want you to realize that he's now carrying on this same framework and this same theology when his disciples say to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Or Lord, if we ought to pray, what we ought to pray for. And here's what he says. Look with me at verse 7 of the book of uh, Matthew chapter 6. He says this, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. 
Now watch this. So when you pray, you pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then when I look at the rest, it says, hurry up and come, Jesus. Hurry up and come. (laughs) You get it? In other words, your kingdom come, your will be done where? How? I mean, don't miss this. Lord, hurry up and come, Jesus. Your kingdom come, your will be done. How? On earth, like it is where? In heaven. So there's two simple things that that I want to share with you this morning from this passage of scripture that I hope will help us to understand more of what the kingdom of God is. And the first one is, is that I think it's very, very important that you and I understand that believers, as believers in Christ, we ought to consistently pray for God's reign in the earth. In other words, here's what my prayer should look like on a daily basis. Hurry up and come, Jesus, hurry up and come. You kind of get what I'm saying? Why? Because uh, if, if, if I had a, any inkling on what Adam and Eve had, I am jealous of that relationship and I want the same thing. So my prayer on a daily basis ought to be, hurry up and come, Jesus, come, hurry up and come, because I want to feel the reign of God in the earth. So here's how Jesus said it as he's teaching his disciples to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I need to pause here for a moment and kind of spend, I'm going to say, the majority of my time with you this morning to help us to understand what the concept of the kingdom is. Because if you're like me, you've heard that the majority of your Christendom, of your Christian journey, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And I'm concerned that our prayer life isn't the way it ought to be because maybe we don't fully understand what the kingdom of God is or what the kingdom of heaven is. So I want to take a moment just to help us understand that so we can be on the same page and walk through what God is saying. So here's some things I want to share with you uh, this morning so we can get a feel of that. The phrase kingdom of God, in both its Hebrew and Greek form, here's what it denotes, so here's what it means. It's the concept of ruling, okay? So let me, let me, let me explain. In other words, it's, it, if I'm saying the kingdom of God, I am speaking more of God's reign or God's rule. Does that make, come on, say man, if this makes sense to you. Come on, say it. Let me know y'all here. So in other words, it represents a sentence. This is important. Of which the subject of the sentence is not kingdom, but it's God. This is very, very important. This is very, very important as it relates to our spiritual journey. Because here is what the majority of my Christendom sounds like when I'm speaking Christianese. You need to be in the kingdom. You need to be in the kingdom. You need to be a part of the kingdom. Or here's what I say. I am part of the kingdom. And we stress kingdom and we spend so much time stressing kingdom that we miss the God of the kingdom. Oh, come on, say it, man. I want y'all to hear me say that. That we are so focused on what kingdom is that we forget the fact that the kingdom belongs to God, if I may say that. So here's what that looks like. And then, and then here's what it means. You've got a lot of us, and let me, I'm putting myself in it, that will spend the majority of our Christian journey saying we are in kingdom, but we don't know the God of the kingdom. Oh, y'all don't believe me. Y'all don't believe me. Y'all, yeah. I've been in church a long time, and the sad commentary about my tenure in church is the early years of my Christian journey, it was more about religion and less about relationship. Am I talking to myself? So here's what, here's what it looks like. I'm going to kingdom, right? And for me, kingdom was defined as church. It was defined as a place where the people of God gathered. So here's what I'd get dressed. I'd put on my matching socks and ties, my handkerchief, get my briefcase, come on. And and, and I'd go to church calling myself as being a subject of kingdom. And my religion was right, but my relationship was not where it needed to be. Oh, come on, y'all. Make me feel good. Say, preacher, that's not just you. I wish I had one person that would have said, me too, preacher. 
Come on, can we, can we be honest this morning? I mean, I was good at it. I was the minister of music. I could direct the choir. I had them slang. I'd go one time, turn around, go, what? You know, y'all know, y'all know how choir is directed to do. I had to move down because I knew how to do church, but I didn't know how to love God. Come on, talk to me. And, and, and I was so good at church that I measured my, my spirituality through the lens of what church looked like. And if you sin, and I didn't sin the way you sin, I fooled myself into thinking I was better than you because I never compared myself to God. And kingdom is not about this, this, this church thing. It's about God. So here, he, I, I want you all to get this because a lot of us make that mistake. We identify ourselves with this thing we call church or kingdom, and we miss having a relationship with the God of the kingdom. So what I'm really endeavoring to do this morning is I want you to switch your vocabulary a little bit, and when you hear kingdom of God, put a line through kingdom and just see God. I wish I had somebody in here. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you got to get this. You got to get that. So, so let me walk you through this. So notice this. Here's what Scripture says. The kingdom of, here's what kingdom means. The kingdom of heaven has arrived. Might be paraphrased this way. God's promised reign is beginning or it is now taking control. I'm explaining a little while, right? So underline this declaration. Here's what one author says. It suggestively refers to as the coming of God. So here it is, here it is. In Genesis, God separated himself from the sin of Adam and Eve, and he promised them, I'm going to send my Messiah to come and redeem you. So when the New Testament now speaks of coming, here's what it says. God is taken over again. Ah. I wish I had somebody in here. God is in control again. Come on, does this make sense? God is in charge again, and God is doing what, what God wants us. Here's it. Your kingdom come. Here's what it means now. God is here. And listen to me. Don't focus so much on kingdom as we ought to focus on God. Does this make sense? Right? Because here's the, so, so kingdom then, listen, look at number E. Kingdom then, it is not a place so much as it is the reign of God. Oh, come on. I want y'all, I want y'all to get this in your straight forward. So, because here's what I used to think. I'm going to become a part of the kingdom of God. And what that says to me is I've got to go somewhere to become that thing. Right? And then I fool myself into thinking, if I don't go somewhere to become the thing, I'm not part of the kingdom. So I want you to change your framework because I'm not asking you to go anywhere this morning. I'm asking you to become or to allow God to reign in you. So here this kingdom is not a place. It is the reign of God. And listen to this. I become the place where God reigns. Oh, I need two or three witnesses in here. Because here's what we do. I was sharing this illustration this morning with first service. So the church says, you know, hey, we need to be a kingdom. We need to be in the world, but not of the world. So here's what we do. We go buy 40 acres of property, and we buy it out in the middle of nowhere, and we build this huge compound, and we build a church in it, and we build a shopping center in it, and we put the mechanic shop in it, and we tell all the people of God, come into kingdom, come into kingdom. And we invite them into this place where no sinners are. And then we call that thing kingdom. And, and so here's what you got. You got a bunch of folk inside this thing, and they claim they have a relationship with God because they're in a place. They mistakenly think the place is kingdom. Here's what I want you to understand. Kingdom is not a place. It is the reign of God. So here's what that means. Wherever God reigns, their kingdom is. You got to get this. So here's what that means. If I'm in here in Sunday morning, because God reigns in me, I am in kingdom. Are you hearing? If I go to work Monday, because God reigns in me, I am in kingdom. Are you getting this? If I go home after church on Sunday, because God reigns in me, guess what? I am in kingdom. So lock into this. Wherever I show up, their kingdom is. 
And we got to get that. We've got to get that because here's what we think. Here's the mistake we make when we leave church. Well, I'm going to lay my religion down because I got to go out in the world. And we have this mindset that I'm stepping out of kingdom. And baby, you can't divorce yourself from kingdom if God lives in you. Come on, I need two or three witnesses that locked it, that really grasp what I'm saying. It's, it's the presence of God reigning in us. It's the presence of God ruling in us. It is the presence of God having dominion over my life. So if God reigns in me, where I show up, there God is. So when he says the kingdom of, of heaven is here or the kingdom of God is here, that means if God is in me and God is in you, yes. come on, is this making sense? Say amen. If this, I want to make sure the kingdom, come on, point to yourself, say self. The kingdom is in me. Certainly, they've been said, neighbor, I'm going to assume you know God. <laughs> so the kingdom is in you. So watch what scripture says. Here's Jesus says. Seek first what? The kingdom of God and his what? What's going to happen? Are going to be what? The text doesn't say go to a certain place. Then you'll get all this stuff. No, no, no. Pursue relationship. Pursue God. You get it? Pursue God. And wherever you go, God is. I wish I had somebody in here, right? Now look at the next one. Again, I tell you, it is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Why is that such a paramount? And I don't have time to really exegete that. Here's what it says. Because our concept of kingdom is so skewed that we focus on what we have. And that blocks us from seeing the reign of God in our lives. Does this make sense? Look at this one, okay? Uh, he says in Mark 1.14 and saying, the time is fulfilled that the kingdom of God is what? At hand, repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom is here, and I want you to get a good feel of that. Look at this one. Mark 4 puts it this way. What can we compare uh, the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use? Look at Luke. For he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for that is the purpose for which I was what? Sent. Now, let me tell you why that is important, right? Here, here, if, if we ever get a grip of who we are, and this is my concern for the church and, and, and Christianity in general, we give the devil more credence. We give him more credibility than he deserves. Why? Because our concept of kingdom of heaven is skewed. So I'm, I'm about to go out in the world. Y'all pray for me because the devil's there. <laughs> Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Yes. And we have this delineation of where kingdom is and where heaven is. And, and so I want, you to, I want you to get this. Here's Jesus. I'm going to show you this. Little. Jesus shows up. And he says, the kingdom of God is here. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. And I want you to notice this. Wherever Jesus went, their kingdom was. So here's what it looks like. He would show up and a demon-possessed man would be there. Notice what Jesus never does. He never focuses or wastes time conversing, dialoguing, engaging with the demon. Matter of fact, when he showed up, the demon trembled at... I wish I had somebody in here. And if we understand that kingdom is in us, listen to me, when you show up, those... Come on, those same, I wish those same demons ought to tremble. We need to realize that the reason God has the kingdom here is so we can go into the world and establish his kingdom in the places where Satan has prominence. Yes. And my goodness, we missed that. So when I show up, when we show up, when you show up, miracles ought to happen. Amen. Why? Because greater is he that is what? Then he that is where? What? So why will I spend the majority of my Christianity worrying about he that's in the world when I have the greater? Think about it. Think about it. You don't see Jesus investing the majority of his time with a focus on the demonic realm. He, he knew that all he had to do was show up. Hey, did you come to cast us out yet? It's not our time. We got about 40 more years. Don't kick us out yet. Jesus said, listen, man, I can't help it, bro. Kingdom is here. <laughs> it ought to be the same for me and it ought to be the same for you. Are you hearing me this morning? 
Very, very important that we not miss this point. So here's what the author is saying. When Jesus showed up, here's what he says. The kingdom is at hand. So, so here, here's, what, here's what Old Testament. Let me go back to the Old Testament. They had this interesting viewpoint of kingdom, right? That in the Old Testament, God is transcendent. He's far. And so they would say he's far away. He is up there. He is this distant God, right? So in the Old Testament, their concept was we need to pray that he come down, that he becomes near, that he becomes who we are. So the Old Testament culture, they had this thing called the Kadesh that, that they would refer to in Aramaic. And what it was, it was a prayer that they would repeat from time and time again. May I be bold as to say it was a daily prayer that they would repeat requesting that the kingdom of God, or not the kingdom, the presence of God be manifest or the reign of God be manifested in their midst. So notice what the Kadesh looks like. Here's what it is. It's just a simple verse that, that they would pray in Aramaic and magnify and sanctify, sanctify be his great name in the world. He created according to his will. Man, doesn't that sound like Matthew 6? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your... You kind of get this? And then look at the next phrase. May he establish his what? When? During our life, your life, and during what? Your days, and during the life of the house of Israel. And watch this. Speedily and in the future. Amen. Here's what they were saying. Just like Adam and Eve. Hurry up, Jesus, come. <laughs> Hurry up, Jesus, come. Hurry up, Jesus, come. And, and there I even said this. Why were they in a hurry for Jesus to come? Put an end to the madness. Put an end to the craziness. Put an end to the situation where we would find ourselves. So in the Old Testament, this is something that, that, that Jewish culture would repeat from time to time. And as a matter of fact, some commentators said it was a prayer that they did every single day. May he establish his kingdom during my life because they fully had the expectation that the reign of God would come on the earth and they would reestablish this relationship with God, bridging the chasm or the divide that has been established. Established. So the New Testament now comes on the scene. And this is real interesting because in the New Testament now, there's a recognition that God is both transcendent and God is eminent and at the same time. In other words, not only is he a God way up there, but he's a God right here. Right? Because remember, remember the promise to Adam and Eve was I'm going to send my Savior. I'm going to send somebody to redeem mankind. I'm going to send this person to reconcile man and bring them back to a relationship with him. And, and what you need to know theologically is he didn't create an angel and send an angel. He sent himself. Oh, come on, I need two witnesses to at least lock into that. So this distant God, lock into this, though he remains distant, he can still be close at the same time. Come on, y'all, that's good news. That's good news to know that God can do that. So, so here's how Mark says it, right? I mean, Matthew. Matthew says it this way in Matthew 3. In those days, he says, John the Baptist, the forerunner, came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and watch what he said. Repent, for the kingdom of God is where? One more time. Repent, for the kingdom of God is where? I, I love this verse. This verse kind of excites me. Here, the Greek grammar of that verbal phrase at hand is, is written in this, this grammatical um, phrase, term known as the perfect tense. Let me explain. Here's what the perfect tense says. Action that happened in the past, that completed in the past, but then it has ongoing results in the future, in the present. Okay? Let me say it one more time. Something happened in the past, and that thing in its totality was completed. It was all done. And because it happened in the past, it didn't end in the past. It continues in the present. Y'all get this? So here's what John's saying. I was the forerunner. Here's my message. Prepare the way for he who comes after me. His shoes I'm not worthy to unleash. Jesus shows up. Hey, y'all, it's here. <laughs> so so, so here, here, here's the perfect tense. The same God, the transcendent God in the Old Testament, 
that used to hang out with Adam and Eve and come down in the cool of the day, the same God who created the heavens and the earth, the same God who spoke and the world came into existence, the same God who clapped his hands and valleys were formed, the same God who stomped his feet and oceans came out of nowhere, the same God who said, let there be and there was, the same God who was the Alpha and the Omega. Come on, I need some. The same creator, the same God who spoke everything into being out of nothing. He was complete in and of himself, by himself. Hey, that same God is here right now, and there is nothing different. Now in this God that you saw back there, he's still creating, he's still doing, he's still the miracle work in God. He is here in the form of his son. You got to get this. In the Old Testament, he's coming and he show up every now and then in the box, right? That's the Ark of the Covenant. You got to get what I'm saying? In the New Testament, you don't need the box He's here. I, I, yeah, come on, come on, y'all got to get this. He's here, and he's here to establish his kingdom. So listen to what scripture says, right? Watch this. Here's what Jesus. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of God, look at the perfect, is at hand. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel and proclaim to them, saying, the kingdom of God is what? At hand. The time is fulfilled that the kingdom of God is what? At hand. Do what? Repent and believe the gospel. Let me tell you why that is so important. This, this is a, that same God that came in the flesh, died and went to Calvary. And here's what he said to his father. I go to prepare a place for you, right? If I go, I'll come again and receive you. But while I'm going, I'm going to ask my father to send the comforter. You all ever heard of the Trinity? Come on, talk to me. The Father, Son, and y'all know that, right? So, so the Son came in the form of God. The Son goes back to, to be with God. Then he releases his Holy Spirit, depending on your denomination. The Holy Ghost, y'all know that one, right? And he comes, but here's what you got to lock into. The perfect tense says, as God was God, as the Son is God, now that the Holy Spirit come, there is no different from the Holy Spirit being God that was God then, that was God on the cross. But lock into this. That same God, if you have accepted him, guess what? He lives where? In you. So lock into this. And watch Jesus when he was on earth. When he was on earth, he went around establishing his kingdom. Interesting. I never saw him have a building fund. But he was establishing his kingdom. Matter of fact, he said, foxes have holes. Birds have nests, but the Son of Man have no place to do what? Y'all know it, but he was established in his kingdom. Well, Jesus, how were you doing that if kingdom is not a place, but wherever I am, their kingdom is? <laughs> you get it? Wherever I am, their kingdom is. And here's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. Church, hear me say this. Pray that the kingdom of God comes. If God lives in you, you need to know that just like Jesus, your job is to establish God's kingdom on earth. So here's what that means. Wherever you show up, there God is. I want y'all to hear me say that. But, but you see, we don't get that. We don't get that. We don't get that. And, and so we show up in places being afraid of the enemy, not knowing who we are. Here's what Jesus said when he left the earth. The things you see me do, what? Greater than these shall you what? do because I go to the Father. He will send his comforter who will be with you, but he will also be in you. We need to call a church demon busters. Because <laughs> wherever we show up, their kingdom is. We, we, we ought to be able to go down to facts. That's cold facts for the safe folk. We ought to be able to go down and, 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 and folk are getting healed. Come on. 
drug addicts are being delivered. Come on, are you with me? Salvation, come on, come on, talk to me. Why? Because wherever, we, listen, we ought to be going around establishing the kingdom of God. But, but the prayer ought to be, the prayer, so here's the, the reason for the consistent prayer. God, I'm not seeing that yet because I don't know who I am. So I'm praying, God, send your kingdom, more of your glory, God, more of your presence, God, more of your holiness, God, more of your righteousness, God, more of you, less of me and more of you because I'm not seeing the sick heal. I'm not seeing the lame walk. I'm not seeing blind eyes being, matter of fact, my marriage is a mess, God, so I need you to work in me because if kingdom is in me, let me feel kingdom. So there's this already and not yet concept of kingdom and already says, if God's kingdom is here, I ought to establish or experience a little piece of that. Are you with me? So, so here it is, here it is, here it is. If I'm not experiencing a little piece of that, I might not want to consult God so much, hey God, what's the problem, as I ought to consult me. And ask this, listen to this, what's wrong with the place where God lives? So the importance of prayer. You get it? The importance of praying until. And last I check, the church isn't doing all that God would call it to do. The church isn't being all that God would call it to be. So, so I, I don't want to so much blame the church as I want to speak to the individual members that constitute or make up the church. My prayer life ought to be such that I encounter God. I see God. Does this make sense? And, and then, then not, let me say this real quick and then we'll wrap this up. There's, there's not only this already, but there's also this not yet piece of it, right? Which means that even though kingdom is now, there's a place where at the end, here's a word that you all may know, the rapture, the eschaton, or at the end of time, that my goal is that, God, you come and bring the kingdom in heaven on earth. Um, your, your kingdom come, your will be done where? On earth. Has it How? As it is in heaven. I'm going to make a statement real quick. So here's, here's what that means. That, that there's a place where even though I am in this world, it is depraved. It is fallen. It is imperfect. So there's a sense where I can't fully realize the kingdom of God or the reign of God in this earth realm because it is sick. But because it is fallen. But there's a sense where as I do my part, the enemy is going to try to undo what I just did. So some point, it ought to get to a place where my prayer sounds like this. God, I, I know. I can do this now because you're here right now, but there's a sense where you're not here yet. And so my prayer ought to be, God, hurry up and come and put an end to this mess right now. And here's what I said this morning. We're not ready to pray like that because we like the right now. Can, can we be honest, y'all? We, we like the drama. We do. We, we, we love and, and here's the truth of what this text is saying exegetically from Old Testament to New Testament. God put an end to this madness and come and take me home. Bring your kingdom. You kind of get it? Here's how Paul said it when he was on earth. For me to live is what? Christ. To die is what? So here's what he, as long as I'm here, I'm going to take the kingdom of God wherever I go. But when I leave this place... I get to be in the presence of God. So here's my prayer. God, put an end to this. Because we're fighting the same wars. We're doing the same things. Yes, people are getting healed, but people are getting sick again. Come on, y'all. People are getting delivered, but others are falling back into drugs. We're getting people off drugs, but the drug dealers are still selling drugs. Come on. Gang violence, but you get one out of the gang, but ten more go. God, put an end to this. Put an end to this. And here's what put an end looks like. He brings his kingdom down, and he establishes it on the earth, and he reigns in his domain. Does this make sense? So, so when I'm saying, God, God, have your way. God moves. Here, say, your will be done. Where? On earth. How? Last thing, one more time. Your will be done where? How? 
Here's what that means, and I'm going to stop. If the reign of God is in me, and I am the place where kingdom is because God reigns, if God truly reigns, I shouldn't have to wait to get to heaven, wherever that is, to reap the benefit. I ought to be living on earth just as if I'm already there. Does this make sense, guys? I ought to live now as if I'm already... You kind of get it? So when I think about heaven, peace, joy, y'all know it, come on. We got songs written about it. When I get to heaven, I'm, we, 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 we got songs written about it. And, and I want us to understand that when he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, sum, to sum this up, let your reign of God, let the reign of God in my life be such that when people encounter me, they encounter heaven. Imagine that. When they see you, it's as if they went to heaven. You ain't cussing nobody out. <laughs> you ain't going off on nobody. You don't look like them. You don't smell like them. You don't talk like them. What's different about you, baby? I'm in heaven already. You just don't know it. <laughs> Here's what they said about Jesus. What manner of man is that? I see him on earth, but he's like he came from God because in my life, the will that's happening in heaven will be done on earth as if I'm already there. Imagine a church like that. Imagine a people like that. So you get it. Pray. I'm selling t-shirts. <laughs> Until God's kingdom come. And here's what Luke 18 says. People ought to always pray. And not what? So it ain't this, we're going to fast this week or pray this week and then we're going to wait till next year and do it again. It's a lifestyle. Adam and Eve, I'm going to stop. I'm going to send my son. Hurry up, Jesus, come. And I'm guaranteeing you, every day, not a moment went by that Adam and Eve didn't reflect on what it was like to have Jesus hang out, to God hang out with them. So in the morning when they got up, God, we miss you. Why do we mess up like that? God, we need you. Hurry up and come, Jesus, come. And they'd come the next day, and then Adam and Eve would get in a fight. And then Eve would look at Adam and said, if God was here, this fight would never happen. And Adam would say, you're right. God, we need you. God, we want you. And they would pray until the kingdom come. Y'all get it. Every single day, they, where are you, God? When are you going to send the son? And see, so here's what would happen. Every time a prophet would come on the scene, here's what they would say. Are you the Messiah? Because they were eagerly anticipating the return of God to establish his kingdom. Imagine a church. Imagine a people. Imagine your life like that. You get it? Bow your heads with me. Lord, you're awesome. You're wonderful. You're gracious. You're merciful. You're kind. You're doing an awesome work in this place, God. You're teaching us to pray like you. You're teaching us to be like you. Yeah. You're praying, God, that we just want to be more like you, God. So have your way in our midst. Thank you for what you're teaching. Thank you for what you're doing, God. Should there be one today that don't know you as Lord and Savior, God, draw them to a relationship. Should there be one that's saying, man, I want my prayer life to be strengthened like that. I need you, God. I need you. I need you. Speak, God, and bring them. And if there's one here that's been coming saying, I'm looking for a church home. I need to connect to this place. Bring them in, God. Bring them in to be more like you so they can be a part and connect with this church. Draw us closer, God, so we can be all you would have us to be.
So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for who you are. We give ourselves to you. In your name. Amen. Come on, stand with me.